Hey guys, welcome to the first episode of the Into the Deep podcast with Father Theodore and me, David Gerges. Today we sit down to discuss having a relationship with God, what that looks like, and why it's important to have one. I hope you guys enjoy this discussion, and um, I hope you tune into future episodes of the Into the Deep podcast. All right, enjoy. All right, so we're going to be discussing building a relationship with God. That's the plan. And I think the first thing I want to get out of the way is what is a relationship with God and what does it look like? What is really, actually, that's a good question. I, I think that, um, sometimes we try to overcomplicate or we, we tend to overcomplicate these things. I think a relationship with God is just like a relationship that I have with, uh, people, right? My, my God is a, is a real relational being. And so the way that I look at my relationship with people is, should be the same way that I look at my, my relationship with God in some aspects. Mm-hmm. I mean, like the fact that like, relationships begin at a certain level and they grow with familiarity and they grow when there's bonds of love and there's sacrifice on both, you know what I mean? That mm-hmm. sort of thing. So, I mean, I, I don't think it's much different. I, of course, there's some differences in the sense of, you know, I don't see God visibly. I don't hear God, you know, talk to me in the same way that you and I are speaking now. Mm-hmm. So yeah, there are some differences, but essentially I should treat my relationship with God as my relationship with others. How do I build my relationship with, you know, my spouse, my friends, my family, whatever. I think it's the same. Or very similar, at least. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, essentially God is our father, right? And so would would my relationship with my dad be a similar way that my relationship with God would work in the sense of like, you know, this is my father and and I'm his son type of thing? Actually, that's why the Bible gives us the analogy of, you know, God as our father, because I think the, the relationship between like a father and son it's probably like the closest relationship that we could say um, encapsulates what it means to be a child of God better than anything else. You know, like, like for me, I have children. Like if, if my kids did something that I didn't like, I'm still going to love them, right? My love for them is not contingent on something that they do. I love them because they're me, mm-hmm. right? They're, they're a part of me. That's why I love them. And actually God is really trying to tell us in the scripture I made you in in my image and my likeness. And I love you because I see me in you. And so that's why I want you to be united with me. But God is even greater than a father because, you know, fathers let down their 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 sons and daughters all the time. And then sons and daughters let their fathers down all the time. But God God is as like sort of the perfect father, right? Imagine your own dad and then imagine him who with all perfect qualities, never falling short. You know, like when you were a kid, mm-hmm. like when you think about when you were a kid, what did you think about your dad? He's the coolest guy ever. He's a superhero, right? Yeah. He, he can do everything. He can lift everything. You know, I talk to Cyril sometimes and he'll be like, he'll, he's like, oh, this car's in the way. Do you think we can lift it? Because <laughs> like, oh yeah, well, he's so, Bubba's so strong. He can do anything. Mm-hmm. And, and and sort of that's really who really God is. God can do everything. And so that's why I think the Bible uses the father, son or father, child, you know, analogy. So, I mean, in, in life, when we, when I think of my relationship with my dad, I think of it, it has stages, I guess. Like when I'm a kid, it's different than when I'm a teenager than when I'm for sure an adult. So right now my dad lives in California and I live here in Tennessee. I don't talk to my dad every day, yeah. but I still consider myself extremely close to him and I know I can call you know him whenever I need anything. Yeah. Does our relationship with God work the same way in the sense of there's stages of it? And what stage would we be in, you know, right now i guess oh okay i I mean i think i think that is true that like our relationship has stages or actually more more what i would say is what i'm doing in my life impacts my relationship with god like you moving Mm -hmm. impacted your relationship Mm -hmm. and you had to do something different to maintain that closeness right so like when people ask me questions like oh buna do you think you should take this job and i was like well what's the the problem and they were like well if i take this job i can never come to church on sunday you know, mm-hmm. and so it's like, OK, well, that will impact your relationship because Sunday, you know, I'm like, I don't know what kind of traditions you had in your own house, but like maybe you had a tradition of like, oh, you know, Sunday after church, we go out to eat or mm-hmm. you know what I mean? It's like, OK, now you can't have that tradition anymore. So our tradition or my tradition is following the command of God to be keep the Sabbath holy. And now this job is going to make me no longer able to do that. Mm-hmm. And so I can no longer have that quality time with my father the way that I was previously. Therefore, of course, my relationship is going to be affected. Mm-hmm. You know, actually, it brings up another point that uh, maybe we didn't discuss, but I but I kind of want to. How my relationship with my actual father mm-hmm. is actually very, very integral in how I look at my relationship with 
God. You know, you, you will find people who have a good relationship with their father, and their father is a good uh, example to them morally and spiritually. They will have a good relationship with God, and they will have a, a well-rounded and good understanding of who God is and who am I towards God and things like that. But those who unfortunately maybe didn't have that for whatever reason really struggle. And and actually, that that's a that's sort of like a warning for us, uh, especially as as men, like people who are to be fathers, right? Uh, like I am the image. You know, people always say like the priest is the image of Christ, and he is. Mm-hmm. And so therefore, I should conduct myself in a certain way. But actually, the father is an image of God to to their children. Mm-hmm. And so when that image is good, my relationship with God is good. I see many people, very holy and devout and spiritual mothers. Mm-hmm. But because the father is not, mm-hmm. you know, you find the child, you know, straying from God for one reason or another. So why do you think that is that the people who have good relationships with their father, you know, in real life, how does that translate into the relationship with God? Is that just because they know what it's like to have a father like because, that? Because again, what does the scripture tell us our relationship with God is like? Mm-hmm. Say, well, it's like your relationship with he's your father. And so for most people that evokes positive, you know, Mm -hmm. things like, oh, my father loves me. My father provides for me. My father cares for me. My father protects me. But unfortunately, realistically, that's not the case always, right? Mm -hmm. Some people's fathers are mean, hot tempered, abusive, God forbid, you know? And so it's like, well, if that's who God, now it's like, is that what also God is? Mm -hmm. No one maybe would say God is abusive or hot tempered, whatever, but they might think to themselves, God is angry with me when I do things wrong. God is uh, like judging me constantly and doesn't, you know, love me if unless I unless I do what's right. God is waiting for me to make mistakes and to punish me when I do, because they they see it in their their father. Mm-hmm. You know, the, that's why it, it is really. I know this podcast is not about you know yeah. how to be a good dad or anything like I, that. I need to learn all I can. For, for <laughs> but what I, but I, but I think I think it's important. I mm-hmm. think it's super important. So uh, along that that same track, uh, I know we discussed a little bit about. Uh, following the rules versus building a relationship. And and that's a, a pretty um, uh, apparent issue for some people and not so much an issue for other people. Um, but when, I, when I'm thinking of um, God as my father and then my father here, when I'm really young, um, you know, you don't, you don't really explain why certain things happen. And dad just tell mom or dad just tell you do it because of this yeah, or because I said so and it's just and I'm is. I'm trying to um, rationalize a way where that uh, the way I think of it for an example like if, if I'm a little kid and I'm going to touch a fire you know my dad is not going to say hey here's why we don't touch the fire and, and <laughs> explain it to me he's going like to <laughs> smack my hand and he's going to say don't touch that and uh, I could argue all I want but you know is is our relationship with God are we kids in that sense mm. that you know, growing up, you're taught, you know, here are the rules. And then later on you incorporate, here's why, or some people they learn by making mistakes. I'm one of those people, unfortunately. (laughs) So I I have to make the mistake myself before I learn why I don't need to do that thing. Isn't there a, there's a saying that says like the, the, the smart person learns from their mistakes. The wise person learns from the mistakes of others. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Neither, unfortunately. (laughs) Uh, I think I, I think there's a, a bunch of things to be said about that. First of all, I think there is value in I do what's right because I'm told it's what it, it is what's right, and I trust the deliverer of that message, and so I do it based on my trust of the deliverer, not necessarily my understanding of the message. What I mean by that is, when your dad smacked your hand and said, "Don't do that," you understood. My dad loves me. My dad is trying to protect me. If he smacked my hand out of the way, there must be some danger here, mm-hmm. even if I don't understand why it's dangerous. And then later, after the heat of the moment, he can maybe go to you and be like, hey, by the way, you know, this is 200 degrees or is, you know, whatever. Uh, and so I think there is value in uh, in sort of like, I trust the deliverer, whether the deliverer is my parents, mm-hmm. the deliverer is the word of God, you know, the deliverer is a servant, a priest, you know. So if, if, if Abuna told me, hey, I really think it's important for you to take communion weekly, you know, to help you to unite with Christ. Maybe in the beginning, I, I don't understand that, but I, I, I hopefully I trust the, the, the deliverer of the message, and so therefore I do it. Then I begin to feel, when I feel, when I get fruits of that uh, practice, I can be like, oh yeah, he was right. 
you know, but sometimes we don't, and sometimes we don't feel, or we don't feel like we're getting fruit of whatever the thing is. So then it makes this question, you know, was that person right? Did they, so I don't think there's anything wrong in saying, now I would like to dive deeper and, and find out the why, because the why will strengthen my resolve towards the thing. So like, for example, for example, you know, before I was a priest, I was a dentist. And so I could tell people, you know, brush your teeth twice a day and make sure you floss. For most people, or well, I don't know, it depends on your behavior, so it depends about your hygiene, but for lots of people, you know, the dentist told me to do so and therefore I'll do it because he's an expert in my oral hygiene. And so he, he, he said to do it, then I should do it and it'll get me good results. Mm -hmm. And then if they do it, you know, they come back and I say, oh, no cavity. And they're like, oh, wow, it worked. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. For some people, unfortunately, <laughs> they're like, well, why? <coughs> I feel like I don't need to floss. I don't get that many things stuck between my teeth. Mm -hmm. and, and, and actually... As a, as, a, as a dentist and as a spiritual father, there is a duty to then explain because my, my hope is in explaining that will give you further encouragement and determination and resolve to do the thing that maybe, you know, if I just said, I'm a dentist, do what I said. <coughs> I, I said to do it, so you should just do it. You know, and you're like, well, okay, I don't care what you said, you know? Mm -hmm. so, so I do think there's a place, a place for both. I think it's, it's good and, and nice and, and, and a virtue to do something for the sake of someone said uh, something to me and I trust the, the deliverer of that message and so therefore I'm going to do it. But I also think that sometimes depending on our personality and depending on the situation has its limits. And so, you know, getting a further explanation can really enrich that thing that's happened. So I do think it's wrong when people will say, you shouldn't have to question. You shouldn't need to question. It's wrong for you to ask why. You should just do it because you know it's right. Mm -hmm. That's that's not enough for people, and that's not necessarily wrong. So when you say when you say building the, or sorry, um, trusting the messenger, in this yeah. sense, this is different than trusting the message that's being delivered, right? So uh, so that's what I'm saying is like you might not necessarily <coughs> understand the message, right? Uh -huh. I, like you know, it says love your enemies, for example. I tell you love your enemies. I tell you because this person did something wrong, I want you to let it go. Mm -hmm. That makes no sense. Turn the other cheek makes no sense. You know, it just on its face, maybe doesn't make sense. There are many things actually in our life, even non-religious things that are paradoxical in nature, right? You know, like uh, you ever hear the saying where it says, you know, if you love something, let it go. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make sense. Paradox, it's a paradox, right? If I love something, I should keep it with me. Right. But but the wisdom in it is I want somebody to be with me um, sort of on their own rather than me forcing them to be with me. Therefore, when I let them go and they stay, now I'm certain means more almost. Yeah, that they actually love me. So there are things in like there are things we do that on its face, on its surface, doesn't seem to make sense or doesn't seem logical. So maybe I don't always understand the message, mm -hmm. but because I understand the deliverer or or I trust the deliverer of the message, I think to myself, I'm uh, like that that message must be true. I have just yet to have a full understanding of what that message is. So I want to I want to pick at that a little bit just because yes. I'm I'm someone who likes to question a lot of things all the time and I do it I, I would like to think that when I do it I have good intentions mm. but to be honest I, I also most of the time just want to really question the um, authenticity of of what's being told to me and if I'm in a scenario where I have this person who's delivering this message to me from someone that I'm supposed to trust. Like let's let's say someone is telling me about my dad yeah. and they say something wrong. Mm. And to me, I just throw away that entire person's credibility sure. and to the point where I will question, you know, not just the messenger, but the message that they're sending. Actually, for sure. And that, and that makes a lot of sense. And that's why, by the way, as, as someone who is considered a teacher, that, that's why we have to be very careful in what we say. Because if I say something that is... Uh, totally against your lived experience mm -hmm. you know you're, you're gonna say actually i don't care what you're saying it wouldn't like i've lived and experienced something completely opposite of what you're saying and so therefore uh, you know and and you're right people throw out the baby with the bathwater. this one thing was wrong and therefore your whole message must be off mm -hmm. so yeah i mean i think it's very important for for us as teachers to be sort of careful in i'm delivering the message of god i'm delivering the word of god i'm not i'm not adding into it anything that is you know, my own personal uh, ideas or concepts about life. And is that, that's, um, nope, I lost it. <laughs> that's okay. I, I wanted to move on to something else. Sure. So, um, 
you know, we talked a little bit earlier about um, my relationship with my my dad and how, you know, when I, when I lived at home, I was see him every day. I talked to him every day and build that relationship. And even now when I don't talk to him every day, I feel that relationship is just as strong as when I was talking to him every day. Sure. Is there ever a point where we get to be like that with God? I mean, the one of the questions I want to ask is, should we pray every day? Yeah. And I, I think the answer is yes. <laughs> Do we ever get to a point where, you know, we're close enough with God that we don't need to speak to him every day. Mm. I think uh, it, when you're asking, like, do we, if you think about like the, the analogy of your own dad, how did you get to the place where you're so close that if I go a day without talking to him, well, let me ask you something. Would you go a month without talking to your dad? I'm sure I've done it before, but it's not it's, typical. Yeah. Not something that I want to do. Yeah. Uh, so what I mean, what I'm trying to get at is there was a probably, I mean, there was for sure a point in your life that he was in your life every single day mm -hmm. right uh, and actually for many hours of the day where you were actually sometimes completely dependent on him right as a child and so you built up a relationship that therefore couldn't withstand some uh level of uh, disconnect um and 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 so you know the the, the analogy is similar but I, the the difference here is like in a, in a father and son over the years you are growing and maturing to become what? More independent, mm -hmm. right? And so there is a concept of like, even like when you think about, you, like you got married recently, like you talk about the, the point is like, okay, I leave my father and I'm my mother and I cling to my wife, mm -hmm. right? So there is this understanding that as I grow and mature, I am releasing myself from this family unit and mm -hmm. entering into this family unit. That's not the case with God. I'm always dependent on God. Okay. I'm always dependent on God. Mm -hmm. So do I need to pray every day? It would be like saying to, do I, does an infant need to be with his dad or his mom every single day? Of course. For sure. Mm -hmm. The only reason he wouldn't is if he's growing and maturing to such an extent that he's independent. Mm -hmm. But there's no, there, you know, like scripture tells us that like God is the person that we have our life, our movement, our being, you know, it, our, our, bra everything that we do is dependent on God. So it, it, it's actually very, it would be very strange to say, and now I am no longer in need of him because of how close we got. Mm -hmm. When I, when I think of externally, someone who's very close to God, or, or when I want to mimic things from someone who I think has a close relationship mm. with God, the only thing I can see on the surface is like their attributes and how they treat people around them. For sure. And so I think taking away from that is like, when I see someone close to God, I'm like, okay, this person is nice to the people around them. They never lose their temper. There's like- uh, Certain qualifications yeah, that you say like, okay, this person's close to God. Character traits that this person uh, shows. And so if I show those same things, I'm essentially thinking, oh, I'm, I should be getting closer to God too. Or yes. I just want the end goal of, I, I'm, I'm, my question is, can someone look at someone who's close to God, take their attributes, and then just kind become of... Become close to God by mimicry. By mimicry, yeah. Absolutely. Actually, that is the concept. That is the orthodox concept of discipleship. You know, and, and that goes back a little bit to what I was saying of like, sometimes I'm getting messages and I don't necessarily understand the message fully, but I, I, but I, but I understand and respect and love or see the results of the messenger. And so therefore, uh, like, I will, I will do it. Mm -hmm. You know, like actually St. Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ, right? And actually, Christ Himself is—he uh, says that He should that imitate me that in my uh, the, the lowliness and the meekness because like, He was lam because He was humble. Mm -hmm. And so, like when I see attributes in people that I consider to be holy, even if I, I don't know their inner life, maybe, but I see attributes in them that are holy attributes. Yes, I I, I, I can use them as inspiration for me. And by doing those things, of course, I will be closer to God. And and actually. What was, you know, I don't, I don't want to quiz you or anything like that, but like when, no. <laughs> when, when, uh, when Christ asked his disciples, he told his disciples, you know, by this, that you will know that you will, that, that you love me if you keep my commandments. And he says, you know, how will people know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another? So he gave us a litmus test of like, how will people know that we're close, that we're close, that you're my disciple? Mm -hmm. I was like, if you have love for one another, then people will know you follow me, you know? You're 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 part of my group. You're part of my team. You're part of my family. Mm -hmm. And so, like you, you kind of said it yourself. When I see these people doing these things, it makes me think 
he's got a good relationship with God. And, and actually, I don't think it's overly simplistic to say, and therefore, if I also do those things, I will also become close to God. Sometimes we try to make it too complicated. Mm -hmm. Yes, if I see good things in people, I should do those things. And I also will become close to God. If I wanted to, to dumb down uh, how to build a relationship with God and what, let, let's say I'm completely new and I, I want to start today. Yeah. You know, I want to, I want my entire life to just revolve around building this relationship with God. Yeah. What should I be doing? Again, I'm going back to the first thing when we talked about like a relationship with God is just like a relationship with a person. Mm -hmm. If we are meeting each other for the first time and we were like, okay, we want to get, we want to get close. What are we going to do? We're going to talk to each other a lot. We're going to spend time with each other. I'm going to start to get to know what makes you tick. I'm going to start to make, to know what makes you happy, what makes you sad, right? I'm going to start, like, you're going to start saying things to me and then I'm going to trust them and then you're going to follow through. So then they, that will build like trust between us. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it, it, all of those things, like to dumb that down back into practical things, talking to each other. So I need to pray, right? I need to pray to God. That's how I talk to him. Mm -hmm. uh, listening to God or having him speak to me. And he speaks to me in many, many ways. And we can talk about that. But like one of the biggest ways that he speaks to me is through scripture, you know, through his word. So I, I read the word of God regularly. Then I go to meet him. I spend time with him, you know, in the Eucharist. And the Eucharist actually... I even and unite with him. I have the opportunity to unite with Christ. And so that's that's a big thing. And then when I read scripture, what is scripture uh, really about, right? Scripture has a bunch of things. It has the story of salvation. It has uh, moral commands that God wants us to live by, but it also has promises of God, right? He says, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. He says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Those are promises, mm -hmm. right? And so when when I when I'm familiar with those, how can I ask God to to like cash in on those promises if I do not know that they exist because I don't know the promises? <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You know. So so when I when I see and read those promises, then I can go to God. Then actually, then it becomes a conversation. You, you know, you read the scripture and it says, you know, my sheep hear no, no hear my voice and 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 I and they know me. God, I'm trying to make a decision and I don't know what to do. And you said, your sheep hear your voice. Therefore, I need you to make your voice clear for me in X, Y, Z, because I am in need and I am your sheep of your flock. Mm -hmm. So I can, I, I can sort of like go back to God and, and put his promise back at him and say, hey, you promised me this. You know, just like actually, again, just like I do with my own, you know, how many times I go to my own kid and they'll say to me, you know, dad, Three weeks ago on uh, at 12.05 a, uh, p.m., you promised that we get to have, you know, three Reese's cups and I only got two. You know, they remember they remember those yeah. things like crazy, <laughs> you know, and it's the same. That's how we should be with God. Right. It's like I remember that you said this and, and you made this promise to me and therefore I need this thing or I want this thing. Be with me in this way or in this time or for this thing, you know, mm -hmm. can that be taken in a in a negative way, though? Can't, can't that be seen as testing God? Or if, if you take it to kind of a place that's not authentic, where it's like God God said... But I'm not, I'm not testing God. I'm, I'm actually like, he said he's going to do these things for me. And I know God's not a liar. So someone like me would say, okay, I know God said he's going to do these things. I'm going to ask him yes. and, and, you know, put these back towards him. Yes. And if they don't happen... Well, but I, I agree. But, but what are the things that he promised? Be careful. He's not promising, for example a new car, a good job, right. you know, you know, mm -hmm. he said, he's going to be with me. He said, he's going to like, oh, he's going to make himself clear and known to me. He, he promised me things that, that he will follow through on. Like, actually, yes, I can ask him those things because he will follow through. One of the most famous examples that we talk a lot about is when we talk about tithing. Okay. And, 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 and actually like, uh, yeah, I know we've talked about this before and you have yeah. an interesting take. Hopefully you'll, you'll, you'll share a little bit, but like it, 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 it like in Malachi, he says, you know, try me in this. It's the only thing he says, you know, try me in this. That if you if you offer your tithe faithfully, that your storehouses will not be overflowing with uh, more abundance than you can ever imagine. So actually, God is asking you and saying, like, my promises are good, uh, and I keep my promises. So of course, I can say, God, you promised me X, Y, Z. Tithing is is one that really hits home because it it really never fails, but every time I'm so hesitant to do it because yeah, well because again it goes against logic right right well how is it logical that if i give away money i will have more money right it's like <laughs> well, if i'm struggling with money now and then i give 10 percent away how does that make sense but i mean 
Well, the thing is, you know, in a very in a very simple way, you know, you have household and you have finances and things. How many times you have unexpected bills, or actually, you know, sometimes hopefully unexpected money coming in from whatever mm-hmm. for whatever reason. And so, if I try to uh, calculate everything, you know, you're gonna find there was things that came up that were out of that were out of our control, whether positive or negative, right? That I could not account for, I could not plan for. And so there is plenty of room for God to bless what I have to make it sort of uh, last or to make it abundant or things like that. And also there's ways for God. I make more than enough money I, that I, than I need, but somehow at the end of every month, I'm scrounging. Right. You know, I don't want to get into specific numbers, but I have, <laughs> I have a, a funny story that actually happened this week. Oh, of, okay. So Sarah... She told me she never... Has, Sarah's going to be happy that she oh, got shouted out on the podcast. She's she's <laughs> really a blessing because I am I never jump to the idea of tithing. I'm never like, yeah, I got to go, you know, give 10%. But uh, we, we talked about it recently and, and we're getting back into it. She's never missed, but I've <laughs> kind of held back. Sure. And so without giving specifics, this I started tithing again and it was one... Out of one paycheck, I was like, okay, I'm going to start now. This one paycheck, <laughs> I gave 10%. Yeah. And I rent my cars out on, on yeah, Turo. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I haven't had a rental in, <laughs> in months. Mo- it's been maybe like nine months since yeah. I've had a rental. Yeah. This week alone, I've doubled what I tied. Sure. And it's like... And you know, and maybe and it could very well be that God is saying, you know what? I want to prove this to you in a very real and practical way. Hey, don't worry. You know, like if you're going to count pennies, go ahead and count pennies, but you're going to end up short at the end. But if you but if you give me what is due to me first, I'm going to bless you more abundantly than you can imagine. That's a wonderful thing, actually. Yeah, it's it's wonderful till till you go back because I feel like once you get these blessings and you you feel like what it's like to be close to God, even if you're better than you were before, sure. As if you're not improving, it almost seems like it's a waste. You know? Yeah. I, actually, one of the ways uh, analogy that uh, one of my spiritual fathers he told me one time that I really liked. Hmm. I think imagine your 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 spirituality or your relationship with God like a like a, a blanket like a white bed sheet okay and the white bed sheet has like stains all over it because of my sin and and when I go and I build my relationship with God and I get closer to him and I repent and I confess I put my my bed sheet in the wash okay and then I could pull it out and you look at it and you, especially if like you could do a side by side like oh it's so clean mm-hmm. But but then you look at it closer and you're like, well, I didn't use bleach. And so it's kind of, it's a little dingy. Mm-hmm. So if I put it again in bleach and then I do a side by side, like, yeah, actually now it's cleaner than I could eat. Like that, that <laughs> other thing was dirty. Like mm-hmm. the, the thing that I thought was clean, it was dirty. <laughs> but now that it's bleach, it's white. But you know, then if I sort of look at it really carefully, maybe I didn't use my Tide pen on certain areas, you know, so there's like, you know, tiny mm-hmm. whatever. So it's like, so I need to clean those. And it's, it's dirty. Actually, it's filthy. Now that I look at it, it's filthy. And so I clean it and I, and I clean it and then, okay, now it's clean. And then, I, and then you can go like even further and say, well, you know, microscopically there, there, you know, there's bacteria here, there's stuff all over the place. There's ways for me to clean it that, it, that actually this is filthy. Would I eat off of this? This is filthy, mm-hmm. you know? And so like, that's, the, that's our spiritual life. Actually, the closer I get to God, because God is perfect. The closer I get to God, the actually more obvious my imperfections become when I have Sometimes when people are far away from God, there's probably one or two sins that are really keeping them away from God completely. You know, I don't go to church or I don't whatever because I have these one or two things that maybe I love to do or I can't get rid of. And they're just really whatever. And then maybe by the grace of God, I get rid of them. Mm-hmm. Right. It would be weird for them to be like, and now, therefore, I have no more sin. Right. <laughs> like, right. They don't do that. Mm-hmm. But what they do do is they're like. Well, actually, now I'm able to look at my the rest of my life and find, wow, actually, there are other, many other ways in which I, I am living my life not according to God's commands. Let me try to work on those. And maybe God will give me grace in those uh, aspects as well. And and that's continuously my, my spiritual life until the day I die. So it's a, it's a never-ending process. Absolutely. I mean, un, until we're perfect, right? And actually, that's the command of Christ. He says, be perfect as your Father in heaven, in heaven is perfect. That kind of t- already answers one of the other next questions that I had was, mm. you know, if, is there ever a point where it, it, not, not the same question I had earlier about, do I need to pray every day and all that, but do I ever get to a point where I'm like, I'm happy with the relationship I have with God. I'm going to just keep it here yeah. from now on. I don't think so. I think, um, to use an analogy like, um, working out or exercising, 
you know, is there is there ever a place that maybe I would be satisfied? I think in some ways, yes, but in some ways, no. So maybe let's say, for example, I had a goal, a weight goal. Mm-hmm. I've achieved my weight goal. But if I don't do something to keep it that way, right? I'm either going to lose muscle or I'm going to gain fat. Something's going to happen because my body is doing things, right? I'm eating, I'm drinking, I'm running, I'm wh- whatever. It's a dynamic thing. Mm-hmm. And so my relationship with God also is dynamic until the day I die and God says for me, hopefully God willing, well done, good and faithful servant, then, then I've completed, you know, I've done, I've done everything to completion. But until that moment, you know, uh, yes, it's a, I'm constantly either going forward or going backwards. Mm-hmm. I have to be, I'm going forward. There's no, like, I'm just staying in the middle, doing nothing. Good where I'm at. Yeah. yeah. All right. So switching, switching gears a little, um, we talked about, um, you know, what I should do to strengthen my relationship with God every day. And I want to ask the question of giving an example of somebody who does everything, every, you know, box they check. Sure. But at the end of it all, they say, I don't feel any different. I don't feel closer to God. I don't feel him in my life at all. Are they doing something wrong? Do they need to just be persistent in what they're doing and keep doing it? And eventually it will make sense. Or where does somebody who's in that situation, how can they uh, overcome that feeling? I'll say something that's going to sound kind of harsh. Mm-hmm. If someone tells me that that's what they're doing and they feel nothing and no difference, I will just say that I don't believe you. <laughs> you're, not, you're not doing everything. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, you know, sometimes I've had people come and say similar things. Mm-hmm. But then when I sort of sort of try to get into, okay, well, what are you doing? They will say, well, you know, I, I prayed a couple times, but then I didn't really like it, so I stopped. Or they would say, you know, I prayed for a week and just nothing happened, so I gave up. Mm-hmm. Or, or they say like, I read my Bible for a couple of days, but then you know, I got distracted, so I didn't. And so I would really examine myself. Have I really, truly uh, done those things with good intention, mm-hmm. wholeheartedly, and consistently? And, and if I did, actually, I have full faith that those things do work because actually they have worked. They've worked in, 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 in my own life personally. They've worked in the lives of the people that I've looked up to and seen in my life personally. They've, they've worked in the lives of those who... God gives us as examples, whether it be the saints or the people in scripture, you know, it ha- it's, we're not reinventing the wheel. Mm-hmm. It's a tried and true formula about how to sort of get close to God. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's cliche for us to say, oh, you should pray every day, or you should read the Bible, or you should confess, or you should, you know, take communion. But it, just, be, you know, cliches are cliches for a reason, right? I mean, because they've been proven, you know, on some level to be correct or t- to work. Mm-hmm. So, hypothetically all these things that you just listed bring you closer to god right yeah and our entire life well i wouldn't say hypothetically but yeah (laughs) okay (laughs) if you're doing them right (laughs) yes they should be bringing you closer to god and they will and my entire life is this constant battle of trying to get closer to god and doing the things he wants me to do and avoiding the things he doesn't want me to do yeah what are some things that he doesn't want me to do or what what happens in my everyday life that takes me away from god Mm. because i feel like Focusing on the goal and how to get there is is one way, but also avoiding the avoiding things. Avoiding the negative. Yeah, avoiding the negatives is another thing that you should be doing as well. I think it's kind of interesting that you brought it in that order because I think actually most of the time we spend lots of time thinking about the don'ts mm-hmm. and not so much time thinking about the do's. So like we think about like, you know, God said don't lie. God said don't say his name in vain. God says, you know, don't steal. God says don't murder. God says uh, uh, make sure you read your Bible. But I don't think about like the do's, which are like... Um, you know, to love and to be kind, to be compassionate. Like today in the gospel is about uh, the widow of Nain and he's talking about like how God had compassion on the on the woman. And so like growing compassion, this is a positive thing, not not a negative thing. And so I think it's, you know, it's interesting that we brought it up in the way that we did because I think we do, I we focus a lot on the negative, mm-hmm. you know, uh, when we're with, with kids, right, in middle school and uh, don't date, don't dance, don't drink, you know what I mean? We're telling them the don'ts. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are there are don'ts, right? And because those things do separate me from God, the sins of the flesh, the 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 the, the lust of the eyes, which means like materialism, the pride of life, which is my ego. Like th- these are the three really main aspects of sin. Mm-hmm. There are sin that have to do with my pride and who I am. There is sin that have to do with my, when I say my eyes, I mean the things that I they want, the things that I want in my in, in my life. And then the sins of the flesh, which are you know the things that are like inherent to my body. So like things like gluttony, things like laziness, things like lust, all of these things. Again, where would I find this like 
group of things to do or don't. I would find it in the word of God. That's how he speaks to me. Mm-hmm. That's how he teaches me. Hey, if you want to be close to me, you know, by the way, we all do this, like with our friends, with our family, we sort of lay out, if you want to be close to me, here's what I expect you to do. Right. But we don't say it maybe that, that black and white, mm-hmm. but your friends, I'm sure know here are the things that, you know, push David's buttons and here are the things that make David happy. Mm-hmm. And I think they try to, if they're good friends, they try to do the do's and don't do the don'ts. You know, I, I don't think mm-hmm. it's much different. Right. I, yeah, I think, I mean, humans in, in general, it's much easier to avoid or it's, it, it's easier for us to not do something than to do something. I agree. And that's why I think we focus on the don'ts. The don'ts are actually easier. Right. Cause you know, St. James says something that's so hard. He says to him who knows to do good and doesn't do it mm-hmm. to him, it's sin. This is a very high standard. When I have in my mind a, a good act to do and I don't do it, that's sin. Because sin means missing the mark, mm-hmm. missing the ideal, right? And actually, that's a very high standard for us to hold ourselves to. When something good pops in my head, do I do it or is it nah, it's whatever, you know? A lot of times we just say, oh, no, it's fine. It's just a thought. That's a tough one because it's, it's open-ended. It's very open-ended. Dude. Well, and that's why when you said like, okay, are we ever done? Well, how could you be ever done? Mm-hmm. Remi- you know, it reminds me of... Uh, <laughs> my sister is a industrial engineer mm-hmm. and like she does stuff I, I actually don't really understand exactly what she does mm-hmm. <laughs> you're an engineer right yep. so i don't understand exactly what she does but essentially like she makes things more efficient right, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, like at her work okay she happens to work she was working at a hospital and i asked her i was like you know once you make things efficient won't they just like fire you like what, what else is there to do <laughs> you know you made it efficient right and she's like, oh, no, it's not like that because there's always more efficiencies to create. And also they're always creating new systems that need to be made efficient. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, no, they're in constant need of this efficiency because you can. there's never a place where we say we are operating at 100% efficiency. Never. So you are no longer needed. Right. But that didn't, that, that I, I couldn't compute that. I was like, no, I mean, you just come in, you fix the problem and it's done. He's like, no, 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 no. There are an infinite number of problems. That's that's funny because there's it's not just making stuff more efficient but it's there's kind of two avenues it's like what is not efficient that we can make efficient and then what's efficient that we can make even more efficient the do's and the don'ts it's just Mm -hmm. kind of like uh, very similar (laughs) okay so i I want to talk a little bit about um the example of the like the lost sheep where there's 99 and then one gets lost sure um does god love each of these sheep the same amount definitely even the one that's lost so much that he'll leave the 99 and chase after the one. Think about why did he leave the 99? He left the 99 because he trusts and knows the 99 will stay. Right? He, like, it's the concept of equality versus equity, right? So, like, did he treat all the sheep the same? No. Did he give every sheep exactly what the, it needed? Yes. Right? The 99 okay, are okay. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, when you have kids and maybe one of your kids is responsible, you say, hey, hold tight right now. I go get the other one. You uh-huh. know what I mean? It's not like you love them different. It's like, well, I can trust that, that this one's going to be okay for now in this moment. And by the way, that doesn't mean that, that that's uh, infinite and unlimited, right? right? If he were to leave those sheep forever, sure <laughs> they, they would also be lost. Right. But, but, it, but essentially, the, 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 like it's, it's, it's important for us to not take parables too far beyond their intended message. Okay. Right? What's, the, what's the intended message here? The intended message is God loves even the people who seem from the outside to be purposely trying to screw up their life and trying to be away from God. And God is going so loves them so much, he's willing to actively chase them, you know? Mm-hmm. And he loves them so much, he doesn't think to himself, I have 99 other ones, who cares if I lost one? That's still a pretty good ratio, mm-hmm. you know? That's the message that, that that God is trying to say. He's not trying to say like, uh, you know, I have favorites. And so at what point does God see that one and chase after, chase after when, I know you're obviously not God, so you probably don't, can't answer this, but um, should I ever be worried that with the amount of times that I mm. go astray and come back and it's like, now I'm close and I'm, I really want to work on the relationship and then I start to veer off. Yeah, Is there... Uh, a limit to how many, not how many times I can do it, but when should I start to get worried? Well, okay. There is a limit and that limit is when I'm dead. 
okay. <laughs> you know god will work to 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 bring me back to repentance until my last breath um how i know this when 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 saint peter asked our lord jesus christ how often should i forgive my brother if he sins against me seven times if you remember his answer, he's 70 times seven. 70 times seven. And he doesn't mean 490. He <laughs> means like an infinite amount of times. Mm -hmm. And so if God, God would never, if we believe God to be just, God would never ask you to do something that he himself is unwilling to do, right? Mm -hmm. So if God is saying, you ought to forgive people as often as someone comes to you and says, David, I'm sorry, like, can we start over? Or can we, can we be okay? Or can you forgive me? He's expect God's expectation is for you to say, sure, I forgive you. So therefore, if that's the standard that he's holding you to, mm -hmm. definitely he's holding himself to that standard. That makes sense. I, I think sometimes we don't believe that, even though we know it and it's very clear in scripture. I think like sometimes we're like, you know, I've messed this up too much. I've gone too far and like, now, now I can't fix it. Mm -hmm. But actually the church fathers all, St. John Chrysostom, he talks about, it's so funny the way he says it. He mentions, he's like, repentance is so easy. All you have to do is you go to God, you're sorry about what you did and, and, you, and you resolve to not do it again. And he's there always to say, sure, I'll give you another chance. And it, it like, it's almost like when he's writing, he's saying like, I can't fathom why people wouldn't do this because it's so easy. All you have to do is just say I'm wrong, admit I'm wrong, ask God for his help, be resolved not to do the thing again. And, and he's willing to take you back always. I think it's because, I mean, the way I would argue is that if someone wronged me a yeah. hundred times, sure. by the 99th time, I'd probably like, be like, it. okay, no more, <laughs> I'm done. You know? Well, I mean, there's a difference. That's why there's a difference between our love and, and, and the love of God. This is also why the father-son analogy or father-daughter analogy, while the closest to, um, to our relationship with God is still even not perfect. Most parents would tell you, if you ask them, is there anything your son or daughter could do to make you not love them, they would say, actually, no, Abuna. There is nothing my, my kid could do. They are a part of me. I will love them forever. But, it, but, actually, but actually, in practicality, you see extremes mm -hmm. where people are like, you know what? Enough's enough. You know, people get cut off. Families get cut off. People, you know, that does happen. Mm -hmm. but, it, but it takes a lot. What, what, why, why God uses this analogy is because he's like, that's how I am, but to the maximum degree. Like that there is no limit of like, and therefore I will now cut you off. Mm -hmm. The only way actually God will cut us off is by our own will. We refuse to go to him. Okay. If we refuse to return to him, he's not going to make us come back. He respects my free will. But then that could lead people to, to do it just to have a safety net. I think. What right? do you mean? I mean, one of the biggest uh, controversies is like, you have nothing to lose by believing in God and and yeah, right. isn't there? This this is a famous philosophical. Uh, is it called Pascal's Wager? I think maybe I don't know. I have to look it up. But there there's a thing of like if you're unsure if you should believe in God, it's better actually for you to believe in God because the alternative is you know an eternity of you know condemnation. Mm -hmm. And if you're right, if you're right, then you'll be in heaven. If you're wrong, you're eternally condemned. So like it's just safer. It's just you know. Yeah, I mean the wor the worst case of either scenario is the same, but the best case exactly is way more beneficial <laughs> if you're right on this side. So yeah. I, I I know a lot of people don't like that, and I I'm someone that like that seems like a cop out to me. But 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 the thing but the difference or the thing that is sort of really important there is that there's a presumption there that I could fool God, that God will mm -hmm. cannot check can, that cannot sense my disingenuineness <laughs> you know god knows my heart actually god knows my heart and intention better than my own we can we can lie to ourselves about our intentions lots of times mm -hmm. you know, say oh i did this for you and it's like well actually no you didn't you did it for yourself and you just you can't really see that you did it for yourself but god knows and so you know that presumes that i am able somehow to to hide from god my true intention you know if my true intention was live a life of sin until my last moment and sort of throw up a couple words of repentance. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, God would, A, would not accept it. B, would make sure that did not happen because God knows. Mm -hmm. and, and, God, and God knows when my, my, my repentance is genuine. Isn't that, I mean, people would think of that as the same as like the thief on the cross. I, I know it's not that the That's case, the thing but... is like, okay, so the thief on the cross, you know, many people get so confused. Like this man lived a life of sin, an entire life of sin. Mm -hmm. And he just said a couple words. And I'm over here for decades, you know, <laughs> praying, reading my Bible, fasting, doing all this stuff. Like, mm -hmm. give me, give me that one, you know, give me that path, right? right. And and it's like, 
he couldn't have planned that path out for himself. God wouldn't have actually accepted them him to plan that path out for himself. But that was the path that he was put on. And God saw his genuineness in the moment, which was a critical moment for him to express his genuineness. Mm -hmm. And he did, you know, uh, actually Christ gives another example of this. That is I, I, one of my favorite parables, the parable of the 11th hour worker. For people maybe who don't know, the 11th hour worker parable is God goes to these people or the owner goes to these people in the morning and he's like, if you come work for me all day, I'll give you a denarius. Okay, it's just a, it's a day's wage. Mm -hmm. And so they're like, yeah, cool, we'll do it. And then like at, that he does that at like six in the morning. And then at nine in the morning, he goes, you know what? I still need more workers. I'll bring them. I'll pay you also a day's wage. Mm -hmm. And actually, throughout the day, he's still getting more workers at noon and at three and whatever. And so the 11th hour, which you think about like maybe an hour before the work is done, mm -hmm. he's still looking for workers. And he's like, hey, I need workers. And they're like, yeah, we'll come. And he's like, if, we, if you work for this hour, I'm going to give you this denarius or this day's wage. And actually what happens is at the end of the day, he starts paying people. And actually, what is the order in which he pays the people? He's like, I'll pay the 11th hour workers first. So he gives them the day's wage. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine the guy was at 6 a.m. He's like, oh, he gave that dude a day's wage. Right. Okay. <laughs> Maybe there's a bonus coming my way, mm -hmm. you know? And so like he, and so he giving, and then when he gets to the people from the 6 a.m., he's like, here's your day's wage. Now they're upset. And he's like, why are you upset? You and I agreed for a day's wage. Mm -hmm. And so did I not give you what I agreed? Don't be evil because, you know, like, because I'm good, you shouldn't be evil. Like, I'm good. I, I was generous and merciful to that guy. Mm -hmm. But that has nothing to do with you. I gave you exactly what you agreed on. And the church fathers teach us that day's wage is our eternal life. Okay? Mm -hmm. And, and he, gave, he gave the eternal life to everybody who faithfully followed him, regardless of for how long or for what the situation or the circumstances. And you, Mr. 6 a.m., don't have the right to judge, you know, the, the uh, 11 p.m. guy. Because it's not your wage to give, you know, and you have not, you're not the owner. <laughs> if he wants to be generous and merciful, what's that to you? Mm -hmm. You know, here's the thing we agreed to. I, I love that parable because it's like, I, I like it because it's kind of like, you know, stay in your lane. You know, <laughs> if God brought you in at, at 6 a.m., great. You know, mm -hmm. thank God. And maybe you will get reward and benefit from that, you know, in, in, in the life, in, in, in your life on earth and, and things like that. If he didn't and he brought you in at the last minute or you accepted him at the last minute, that's also a blessing, you know, and then I should just kind of. Mind my own business, really. <laughs> That's the first time I've heard I've heard that parable. Actually, I don't know if, if you're the six a.m. guy though. You you kind of there's a, a little bit of resentment. It's like you feel like you got cheated. But that's the lesson. Did you get cheated? You I agreed mean, to a certain wage. Mm -hmm. If I decided to be generous to the other people, what is that to you? Well, did, yeah, you did you not get what I we agreed to? Yeah, I guess that's, if that's the. And the other thing is like when you th when you think back on like what is the wage of mm -hmm. wages eternal life actually this is an amazing gift this is an amazing reward mm -hmm. it's not something where I feel like shorted what guess, more could I be given than uh, actually the church fathers also teach us like the denarius mm -hmm. whose face is on it the probably usually the king of the country or whatever so the denarius like I what am I receiving I am receiving Christ mm -hmm. and so they've all received Christ what more gift do you need then I have given you myself. This actually reminds me, something you said just reminded me of something that I was thinking about today in church because I knew we were going to have this talk and I was mm. like, let me think of something, <laughs> something good, right? Um, it's, I don't know how to word it in, in a way because I didn't really think mm. exactly what I was going to say, but when I think of um, position, people in positions of power, sure, it's very intimidating. Right. Like let's take my job, for example, if when I think of my manager, I'm like, oh, you know, I, I don't want to upset my manager. I sure. want to just, you know, and then it's a, take my manager's manager and then you could go all the way up to CEO. Right. Sure. And if the CEO walks in, the place better be spotless. And yeah, it's yeah. like you, you look at him the wrong way for one second, you're fired. Yeah. And I was thinking like it, it's hard to imagine God as your father and not the CEO of like life itself. Sure. Right. Well, because I mean, he's both actually the best analogy is like, what if your father was the CEO? Oh, then you get a free pass on everything. You don't, <laughs> you don't have to do anything. You're but, just... but it, maybe your father was the CEO, but you knew he was a fair person. Oh, he then. wouldn't treat you differently, mm -hmm. but you know, he's your father. So that means I know he's going to be just, I know he's going to be loving. I know his characteristics, but he has the same expectations of me as every worker. I didn't think about it like that. I mean, <laughs> you put it like that, it makes sense. But 
And so I would, I used to argue with one of my friends who's not atheist, but agnostic. So he's, yeah. he's not, he's very, uh, he just likes to argue kind yeah. of. And he, he's one of those people that's like, I can't believe in a God that, uh, you know, allows all these bad things to happen. Sure. And, it, and, you know, the good person who's not baptized, I can't believe in a God that would let them perish type of yeah. thing. And uh, I think the analogy that I gave them when I was, when I was very not, uh, I'm still not, but back in the day, I was like, think of like a marathon, like someone running a marathon. You have to pay and sign up for the marathon. And when you finish the marathon, you get a medal and a shirt and everything. Sure. Anyone could come in and run the marathon. Sure. And you could run it faster for all, for all the people care. But if you didn't, if sign, you, up. If you didn't sign up, you're just running to run. You yeah. know, you could do it better, faster, whatever, mm. but you're not going to get a medal at the end. Mm. And that's kind of the analogy that I gave him. And he, he didn't like it, but I was like, I think kind of. That's actually a very good analogy. And you know what's so funny is like your analogy is not that far off from um, St. Paul's. St. Paul actually gives a very similar analogy. Mm. I'll read you something from scripture. Actually, I think it's kind of cool. St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is tempered in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an unperishable crown. Therefore, I run thus, now with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. So he's saying like, you know, everybody, everybody is in the race, but you have to actually run in a way that is the right way, mm -hmm. you know, to, to obtain the, the prize. Right. And so it's like, yeah, when, when you say like, you know, can anybody have a relationship with God even outside of a relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ? Actually, the answer is no. You know, Christ said, he said, no one comes through the, to the father except through me. Mm -hmm. Okay. But how that looks on an individual day to day basis, that might differ. There are things that God commands us. And, and as I, as a child of God, he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Okay. If you love me, keep my commandments. Mm -hmm. And so then he says things to us like, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. So he commands to, to partake in the Eucharist. Uh, you know, God says, keep the Sabbath holy. This is a command. Mm -hmm. You know, God commands us. He says, unless you are born again of water and spirit, you will by no means enter the kingdom of God. So he commands us to be baptized. So, so I ought to follow. I should run in the race in the way with the rules that the, the, the race, uh, uh, you know, the preparer of the race has mm -hmm. outlined. Right. Right. Uh, and so like, yeah, the, like there are, but there are sort of then within the race, how am I striding? What am I doing? Yeah. It might differ from person to person, but, but there are certain guidelines that, that God gives me. Maybe I dedicate my life to service. Maybe I dedicate my life to prayer. Maybe I'm a person who, um, you know, is very wealthy and I am very generous with my wealth. You know, there are many, many aspects in which I can grow to, in God that are individual to that person tailored based on their gift, tailored based on the talents that God has given them. Mm -hmm. You know, actually, a little small interesting thing in the liturgy, he says, he taught us the ways of salvation. Mm -hmm. He taught us the ways of salvation. And there was a period of time where some uh, people suggested we should not say, taught us the ways of salvation. Okay? And even in Arabic, it's plural. Mm -hmm. um, the problem with ways. The word yeah, ways they the wanted it to say, taught us the way of salvation. And actually at the time, uh, His Holiness Pope Shinuno was like, no, ways of salvation is fine because my way is to enter the monastic life. Your way is to be married. Your way is to be a priest. Your way is to be a doctor or a lawyer or whatever. You know, the, But I achieved or I can achieve my salvation in those ways. There are many ways. Mm -hmm. But with the people who are saying way, they were saying, there is only one way. No one comes to the Father except for me, Christ. Right. You know, and Pope Shino was saying, yes, of course, we believe that. But ways means like there are there are the means to salvation that are that are maybe differ from person to person based on their individual uh, needs or experiences or things like that. But they all are the same way because Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So it's almost like like two legs to it. Like there's yeah. the path to Christ and then from Christ to well, salvation. I think that, I think it's more like there's the path to Christ, uh, and 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 there are people who are on that path in varying ways, mm -hmm. but the path has to be to Christ, right? If my path is leading me somewhere else or to someone else, then actually it doesn't to me as a Christian, it doesn't matter how you run it, right? You're going to the wrong direction, mm -hmm. so so it's, it's going to be irrelevant. So baptism 
is is a, one of the things, and I, I know a lot of people have issues with it, of if you're not baptized, you, you can't get to heaven. And my question to that, and I'm sure there's a lot of people who ask it and probably had an answer already, but I don't actually know the answer, is the, the thief on the cross was not baptized, but also made it to heaven. What's what's the... How? D- yeah, how? What, what did he do? Or Yeah. I mean, you know, it kind of goes back to the question that your agnostic friend, he was kind of like, well, I don't get it. Kids that are didn't have a chance to get bapt- uh, baptized or really good people, but they just never had a chance to be baptized. Why is it that they... How could a just God let them be in eternal punishment? Mm-hmm. So I'll try to answer the question about the thief, and then I'll answer this question about, like, you know, why would God punish people just because they didn't do this one ritual or ceremony? Uh, first thing about the thief on the cross, Christ outlined here is the way in which you should uh, enter salvation, to be baptized. This person had no opportunity in, in to be baptized. And so, you know, Christ looked at his faith. If this man had an opportunity to baptize, he would have. Mm-hmm. He would have. Do you think if they were not on the cross and Christ said to him, go get baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, he would have been like, nah, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he would have been baptized. Right. So it was, it was a more of a practicality of his, his literally his physical condition. He couldn't, he couldn't be baptized. And God, who is the creator and author of the law, it is within his purview and his right to make exceptions, mm-hmm. you know? Like you say, yes, this person will enter without baptism because he was actually, there are writers who say he is baptized by blood. You know, yeah, he was yeah. baptized in blood. Mm-hmm. But but even you, if you want to be very technical, you say, yes, but he wasn't baptized. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so like, you, if you want to be that technical, the, what I would say to you is the author of the law has the, 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 rain, the, the freedom, the purview to be like, yes, and here's an exception and here's a good reason Actually, I don't even have to answer to you as a reason, as God, you know? Yeah. I don't need to answer to you and give you a reason. Don't owe us anything. He doesn't owe us anything. But but like it, it, God, if I know God to be just, then I know if he allowed that person to go into the kingdom of heaven without baptism, God has a very good reason why he did that. Mm-hmm. So then uh, so then the question then comes of like those people, the good people that, you know, they're good, but they didn't get a chance to get baptized or the babies or and things like that. The, you know, people that are, had no opportunity to be baptized, I think it would, you know, again, this is sort of God and his view of salvation. Anytime we speak about these things, we have to speak about it with some humility, knowing that God is the one who ultimately makes those decisions, not us. Right. But what I would say is I know the characteristics of God. God wants me to be in heaven with him. God loves me. God doesn't desire the death of a sinner, but rather that he would return and live. So God wants my salvation. Therefore, and also God is just, right? God is fair. These are, these are characteristics of God that I know he has because that's what scripture tells me he has. And that's what we experience when we experience God. So knowing those things, it, it, it doesn't really make sense on the surface that God would be unjust with these people who had no opportunity. Mm-hmm. Okay, But then also I, I do want to say the caveat of, you know, did they really have no opportunity or not? You know, when we talk about babies and things like that, of course, they didn't have an opportunity. Right. But there are many people who are familiar with the scripture or have heard about Christ and reject him. And and I don't think it's an unfair thing to say God will hold all of us accountable for our actions. You know, mm-hmm. um, th- this is a, this is something that I think we all strive to to do to one another, right? We hold each other accountable for the things we do. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, have I been presented Christ or have I heard about the the, the gospel message? Um, you know, for, for you and I, of course, we have no excuse. And I would say for most people, they've at least heard the gospel message and they decide for themselves sort of whether to follow it or not. Mm-hmm. And I used to think about that a lot. And are, aren't we parents that teach their kids about God and, and showing them about, you know, the way the, yeah. through baptism and everything, aren't they almost setting their child up at a disadvantage well, they're setting themselves up at an, at an advantage, but they are setting themselves up for stricter judgment, for sure. Okay. Because Christ says, to whom much is given, much will be required. Mm-hmm. And so I've had a leg up. Maybe I was living in a, a family that prioritized uh, the Christian life, taught me to pray, taught me to read, taught me about scripture, taught me the church, l- taught me the, the sacraments. The, and God will call me at the, in the second coming and said, I gave you, you know, in the liturgy of St. Gregory, it says, you have given us all the remedies that lead to life. So it's like, you didn't, and he says, you have not left me in need of any of the works of your honor. So it's like, you gave me 
all the, 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 the components that I would need to be successful. And actually, we can say that for every everybody. God has given every person the, the, the components that they need to be successful. And that may look different for different people. Mm -hmm. And so if I was given more of those components, yes, of course. You know, just like the parable of the talents, right? Mm -hmm. If I was given uh, five talents, I'm expected to make 10. When I was given two, I was expected to make four. That person was given one and, and he ended up only with one, probably was expected to make two. You know what I mean? But they weren't, they were all successful that grew their talents, but right. they didn't. But if you look at it from a straight numbers, they didn't grow them all the same. Right. So uh, a, a kind of a, just a side question on the talents. Thing, yeah. Just because uh, I think in numbers a lot. Do you think in this parable that uh, the person who gave them the money and wanted them to double it was equally as mad as the person who buried their treasure as he would have been with someone who hypothetically lost it all? Do you think there's the same, like, because you could argue that the person who buried it was worried that he was going to lose it. So he wanted to pay back what he was sure. given. Yeah, he didn't make any, but he yeah. also didn't lose any. I'll say a couple of things. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the parable isn't meant to be taken beyond its, its sort message, of central right. message. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if, I, if the person would have lost his talent, I don't think God would have said, well, you tried. So, like, you know, that, that's good. No. What, 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 what actually the, the central message of it is, like, I need to produce fruit. Okay? It's not enough for me to just sort of st stand pat with what I've been given. It's, it's, so, if I, like, the analogy, your analogy means I used the talents for evil, for example. That would get me zero or negative, right? right? God gave me talents, and not only did I not use them for good, I used them for evil. Mm -hmm. I don't know. God would not look at that person better than the person who didn't use his talents at all. This person was bad, and this person was really bad. But right. the, the, they were both negative things. So you know? the mark of success is producing talents, not yes. giving Scripture back. Scripture tells us why did God give us gifts is for the, the benefit of the, the community of the believers, you know, for, for the people around me, for the church, for in, to, in the service of others. So one one more thing I want to ask about. Um, you said the only way to God is through Christ. Yes. When we say our relationship with God, we kind of we kind of touched on it last time. But what does a rela does a relationship with God and the Son and the Holy Spirit are these all different? Oh, you're talking about when the Trinity, the Holy Trinity. Yeah. I mean, because when I think of there is no one who comes to me except through Christ. Mm. I think now I'm thinking of, okay, there's God the Father and then there's Jesus Christ. So I need to, through Jesus Christ, I think I kind of just answered it in my own head, but I want to hear what you, what you have to say of. Yeah, you're actually right on, you're, you're right on it. So it's like, okay, I want a relationship with God the Father, for example. Mm -hmm. And Christ is saying, you know what? There was this problem called sin mm -hmm. that prevented you from being having a relationship with God the Father. And guess what? I came to 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 die for you to remove that sin so that you, if you accept me as your savior, I, you can have access. That's what actually St. Paul talks about, having access to, to the holies, you know, have access to God the Father through the, the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's only through me. And then how the Holy Spirit fits in is like when the Holy Spirit dwells in me and convicts me of sin, he brings me to the, right, to the righteousness that, that is required for me to approach God. Mm-hmm. I have a separate question that I don't think we'll have time to get into. <laughs> this is a, Maybe a topic for a, yeah, a topic for a different day. But I think uh, I think it's a good spot to wrap it up. What do you think? Sure. I think this was probably the best one we've done so far. I think it worked out pretty well. 